want to welcome you again into my study. I don't know how you found us, if you're visiting with us, but we certainly welcome you. I welcome the congregation who not normally gathers at Grace Baptist Church in Essex. Hard to believe this is Sunday number six in self-isolation. Now, there's no comparison really to what God's people have experienced in the past. We're nowhere close to the 400 years that Israel had to spend in Egypt or to the 70 years that they were in Babylon. But certainly in our hearts, there's a sense of that longing to be able to get back together and to worship God. But for now, we're thankful for the means that God has given to us. And so however you've come to join us, I certainly welcome you and may we worship God together, especially as we spend time focusing on his word. Would you please join with me as we ask the Lord to come and bless this time. Our God and Father in heaven, we confess our absolute need of you. We come as your people, desiring to worship you, especially as we would listen to your word, and we want to honor and glorify you. We pray that you would come to each one of us as we gather in our separate homes, and we ask that you would meet with us and that you would minister to us through your word. Father, again, we pray that you would bring this time of separation to an end. We long for that day when we can gather as your people and bring you the praise and honor and glory that you deserve as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us in this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, would you please take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm number 57, and we'll use this psalm to begin our worship together. Psalm number 57. This is a psalm that David wrote. It comes from that period of time before he was the king. He'd been anointed by Samuel. We know he was marked out to be the king, but Saul was still on the throne, and Saul, in jealousy, was chasing him, wanted to kill him. And so this psalm comes from that time, Psalm number 57. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, the God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts, the children of man, whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. Now, David was a man who obviously knew great troubles, and this psalm clearly comes out of one of the great times of trouble in his life. He describes it in verse 4 by saying, my soul is in the midst of lions. It must have been a terrible time as he experienced people hating him and wanting to kill him. 
And so the psalm is a cry to God for mercy. We see that in verse 1. He's crying out for God to see and to come and to help him and to rescue him. Very clearly, he has this understanding that in the midst of this trouble, he can hide himself in God. He speaks of taking refuge in the shadow of your wings. And we think of this little baby bird coming to find shelter and rescue under the great outstretched arms of the mother bird. David has that sense of he can trust the Lord. He can find the help that he needs in God. And it's interesting to note how David, he's coming to God out of the midst of his troubles, but he really ends up praising the Lord. And you see this in the refrain in verse 5 and in verse 11. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And so as he comes to God out of his troubles and he's brought to think more and more upon the Lord, his heart is stirred to worship. Well, whatever circumstances we come from today, whatever troubles may be pressing in upon us, may it be that we'll be helped by the Spirit of God to end up praising the Lord, this highly exalted God who deserves all of our worship. Now, we can't gather and lift our voices to praise the Lord, so I'm going to read a hymn to you from our hymn book, uh, number 51. It's familiar. We, we sing it sometimes, and it's based on that wonderful promise at the end of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So. If you're a child of God, whatever you're experiencing, mercy and goodness from the Lord is with you, guiding you today. That's what this hymn is all about. When all thy mercies, O my God, my rising soul survey, transported with the view, I'm lost in wonder, love, and praise. Unnumbered comforts to my soul, thy tender care bestowed before my infant heart conceived from whom those comforts flowed. When worn with sickness, oft hast thou with health renewed my face, and when in sins and sorrows sunk, revived my soul with grace. Ten thousand thousand precious gifts my daily thanks employ, nor is the least a cheerful heart, excuse me, that tastes those gifts with joy. Through every period of my life, thy goodness I'll pursue, and after death and distant worlds, the glorious theme renew. Through all eternity to thee a joyful song I'll raise, for oh, eternity's too short to utter all thy praise. Amen. Well, may our hearts be in tune with the hymn writer, looking at our lives and seeing all of the ways in which God has so faithfully ministered to us, how he's cared, to us, uh, cared for us with tender kindness and love. Well, I trust we all know this is a time for prayer. Perhaps, well, not perhaps, the most important thing we should be doing is praying and seeking the face of God and asking for his help. So please join me again as we go to the Lord now, uh, requesting for the needs of our world. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be reminded by your word that we can always come to you no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. And we thank you that you are a God who cares. That amazes us that you are the Lord of heaven and earth and you are ruling over the entire world. How is it that you watch us? So insignificant compared to what's many things going on and yet we thank you for your constant care and your provision for us. 
Lord, we come to pray to you for our world, the desperate need of our world. We hear day after day of people dying from the virus and being reminded of people dying for other causes as well. Lord, here is a world where death is still reigning. Have mercy upon our world, O oh God. We pray for people who are paralyzed with fear and worry during the time of this pandemic. People who have no hope for the future at all, looking to government, looking to scientists and health authorities, hoping that they'll be able to get us out of this mess. Oh, our Father, have mercy upon our world and remind them and show them and teach them that you are the God of our salvation. You are the one who can rescue us. We even remember last Sunday that terrible killing spree in Nova Scotia and ask that you would have mercy upon the families and the communities that are still grieving. And through this disaster, may they turn to you for the help that you are so willing to give. We thank you for the gospel that you have brought to us the good news of sins forgiven and the gift of eternal life and peace with God through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank you that you sent your son into the world to be the savior. Thank you for his perfect life of obedience that has provided for us the righteousness that we need. Thank you for our Savior's death on the cross, that he was willing to suffer all that physical and spiritual torment and endure the wrath of God that our sins might be paid for. Thank you for his resurrection and his triumph over the grave. Help us to live in the light of that victory. And Father, we pray that you would preserve your church during this time when we are separated from the means of grace, we can't gather together and be your church. We can't experience that two or three gathering under the name of the Lord Jesus and knowing our Savior's blessing. But Father, we pray that you would Come and help us in this abnormal time. Preserve your church. Prosper her testimony, even through these digital means. And in your perfect timing, bring us back together with praise and thanksgiving for all that you have done for us. And we do ask our God that you would come and bless your word today. Help us, our God, to be able to li listen without distraction. Come and minister to our hearts by your Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now if you would please take your Bibles again and turn with me in the New Testament to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 5. 1 Peter, chapter 5. And we're going to consider a text from the Word of God that I think is probably very familiar to everyone listening in today. First Peter chapter 5, and we'll begin reading at verse 6, and we'll read down to verse 11. First Peter 5 and verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you be sober minded be watchful your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour resist him firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world and after you have suffered a little while the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, it's clear from this text of scripture that we've just read, as well as the entire letter, that the Apostle Peter is writing to a people who are being persecuted. In fact, in the first chapter, he compares their suffering 
to something like passing through a fiery furnace. So clearly they were undergoing great trials. And he even warns them in this letter that their trials, their suffering, was going to get worse. Now, in the midst of all of that, he calls upon them to be strong in their faith, to look to the Lord Jesus Christ and to be strong in their Savior. They were experiencing oppression from government authorities. And he called upon believers to honor and respect those authorities who were mistreating them. So here is a troubled people. Now, as you study through this letter and, and come to this section, you discover that Peter is a man who felt deeply for these people and their trials. And he sought to do all he could to encourage them. He used the powerful tools of the gospel to lift up their hearts, even bringing them to the foot of the cross to remind them of the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ in our place. Now the text that we have before us in verse 7 is another example of his concern for their emotional well-being and spiritual stability. It's a very tender word obviously with the purpose of lifting up their hearts, pointing them to the God of all grace and mercy. It's important for us to remember that this text doesn't speak merely to first century Christians. As the old writers used to put it, this word of Peter's is like a cordial for the heart, a glass of medicine that refreshes the heart and fills it with hope. Now it could be that today as you listen, this is a cordial that would be good for you to take. But like any medicine, it's only good if you take it. You can look at it sitting on the shelf and understand all of the benefits, believe that it would be good for you. But until you actually pour it into the spoon and swallow it, there's not going to be any benefit. But my prayer today that God will give us listening ears and as we listen, that he will grant faith to us through his word and his spirit. Faith to believe his word and faith to obey it. Now we begin this morning by considering, first of all, a constant problem afflicting the people of God. A constant problem afflicting the people of God. Now I think we're probably all familiar with Peter's expression, especially maybe from uh, an older version of the Bible. Cast all your care upon him. The word that he uses here for care has the idea of worries and anxieties. It's a description of the trials of life pressing in so hard that your heart takes up these concerns and is just continually going over them again and again. Now we can certainly understand why these people that Peter was writing to had such cares or anxieties. They were being persecuted. Some of the Christian slaves were being beaten. There were wives who were living with unconverted husbands and they were wondering what's going to be next for us. Peter had warned them about increasing suffering that was going to come to those who confessed the name of Jesus. So no wonder that their hearts were being filled up with these cares. It doesn't take a lot of careful analysis to figure out that you don't have to be living in the persecuting times of the first century to have worries. Our present pandemic has certainly stoked the fire of worry in the hearts of many people. Yet worry was a problem long before this virus came to our shores. We are living in one of the most prosperous, comfortable periods of world history, at least here in Western society. And yet people are filled with worries. The suicide rate is high. People are popping all kinds of pills in hope of calming their nerves. And if we are honest, even as Christians, there are plenty of times when our hearts are filled with cares. 
the economy of the economy of course is a huge issue right now and people are perhaps worrying more than ever before about their finances questions such as will i have a job in 6 months will i be able to pay my mortgage will my retirement fund be worth anything when i come to the point of retirement is the economy going to come back to an upward trend Will the boom in real estate and renovation continue to provide jobs? All kinds of questions filling people's minds. But worrying doesn't just have to do with finances. What parent hasn't been severely tempted to worry about his or her children? Here are precious gifts that God has given to us. And as he gives those gifts of children to us, there's a built-in longing for their well-being. Most of all, we desire that they would come to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and grow up to be godly men and women and wise. We want them to be safe and be able to prosper in their life's calling. It's our desire that they would know joy and happiness in marriage, and the list goes on and on. The temptation is fierce to be filled with concern about our children. As Christians, thinking about areas of concern, it's hard to escape the temptation to worry about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We struggle to bring together what we know about the church theologically with what we have experienced. How will the church survive? How will she grow? How will she be provided for? How is she going to fulfill her role of bringing glory to God in the world? If you have a heart for Christ and his work, it's hard not to have your heart filled with these kinds of concerns. We might think back to a preacher like Charles Haddon Spurgeon in London in the 19th century. He had a church filled with 5,000 people. And so you would think, well, he would never have to worry. But listen to what he has to say as he speaks about this subject of worry. Then there will be another anxiety, one which frets me often enough, which is the success of God's work. Oh, when there are souls converted, how our heart leaps for joy. When the church keeps continually increasing, how glad we are. But if there is even a little lull, we feel so sad. If we do not see God's arm always bare, we are ready to lie down and say, Lord, let me die. I'm no better than my fathers. So here on the one hand is a holy zeal for the church of God, and yet how easily it can be accompanied by a worry and anxiety that are not honoring to the Lord. So how important that we recognize this fact that Peter points to, that worry is a constant problem afflicting the people of God. It's a sin that is universal in its menace. I doubt that there's anyone listening today who has not had to wrestle with a heart filled with worry. Perhaps even now, the battle is raging in your soul. Some anxious care has filled your heart, and you haven't even been able to worship God this morning. You've been so distracted. Peter's not hard-hearted about our struggles. He wants to help us. But this is the problem that we're up against. Worry, anxiety, cares. That leads us, secondly, to consider the biblical solution, the biblical solutions. Peter's words are very simple as he lays out the solution, casting all your anxieties on him. That's what we're to do. That's the answer to the anxious thoughts and worries that grip us and try to take over our hearts. We're to take them all and cast them onto the Lord. Now, the word that Peter uses here is very picturesque. It's a word that speaks of taking a covering, something like a blanket, 
and throwing it over a riding animal, a horse, sort of like a saddle cloth. There's only one other place in the New Testament where this word is used. And it's when the Lord Jesus in the Gospels was getting ready for his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the disciples brought the donkey to him and they took their coats and they threw them over the donkey so that Jesus would have something to sit on. You can even picture that, the disciples casting their coats onto the back of this donkey. Now that's what we're supposed to do with our cares. We're to take them like a big saddle cloth, a blanket, and throw them onto the Lord. Now, it's obviously picture language. What does it mean for us to cast our burdens onto the Lord? Well, it implies clearly that we have to do something. We have to take action. And I think there are two things in particular that we need to be doing. We need to be, first of all, exercising faith in God, and then secondly, praying, which of course is part of having faith in God. So let's think about these things that we're to do if we're to cast our cares upon the Lord. First of all, exercise faith in God. To cast your cares on the Lord means that you believe that he is willing and able to carry them. It means that he's big enough to deal with all of your problems and bring them to a proper conclusion. You've probably all seen the mythical image of Atlas with the world on his shoulders this great big muscular man, and he's got the globe, the world, on his back. Now, it's a mythical picture because we know that's impossible. No man can bear the world or the heavens on his shoulders. But our God, the God who spoke the heavens and the earth into existence with a word and continues to uphold everything by that same mighty word, he's able to take our cares and carry them. Our Savior is the one who said to people interested in being his disciples, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, all of you who the pressures of life are weighing you down. Come to me, give them to me, and I will give you rest. He's able to take our cares, our worries and anxieties, and he can deal with them. What an infinite mountain of sin Christ bore when he went to the cross on behalf of his people. Not only did he bear our sin, but he dealt with it. He paid the price for our sin. He buried them in the deepest sea. He opened the door of heaven for us. Surely if he can do that for our sins, then he's able to take our worries and our anxieties and deal with them. This is the same God who has promised that he is able to make everything that happens to his people turn out for our good. He's promised to provide your daily bread every day that you live in this sin-cursed world. He's promised to use his riches and glory to supply your every need. He's able to work in the hearts of his children to bring glory to his name. He's able to work in the hearts of your children to bring glory to his name. And he's determined to so work in the world that when the final day of world history comes, a tumultuous shout of hallelujah will rise up from his people to the glory of his name. God's not going to be defeated by anything, by this pandemic, by any of your cares or worries or anxiety. Brethren, why do we worry? Your God can take care of it. We have to exercise faith in God. But then secondly, we need to pray. Not only do we need to exercise faith in God, but in that exercise of faith, we need to pray. You need to bring your cares to the Lord 
and tell them all to him. You've got to pray to him over the things that burden your heart. And often you must simply confess to the Lord, I can't carry this burden. You've got to carry it. We must have this as a constant determination to keep casting these things upon the Lord in our prayers. Now, one of the things that is so characteristic of sinful worry, I think we all know this experience, it just keeps reappearing. You think that you've prayed and you've cast it on the Lord, and there it is again in your heart, seeking to stir you up and cause you be, to be troubled all over again. Well, you must do with it what you've done before. Keep bringing it back to the Lord. And every time it raises its ugly head, cast it on the Lord. Be determined. Keep bringing it to God in prayer. The biblical solution that Peter gives us is so simple that we might be tempted to wonder, does it really work? Can we just take all of our worries and, and, and cares and like a spiritual blanket, cast it onto the Lord? Does that really work? We know how easily our hearts can get stirred up and how sorrowful these worries can make us. Can it be true that we can just cast our cares upon the Lord and he will take care of them and bring peace to our hearts? Well, there's many, many examples in the word of God that this is true. We began reading from David in Psalm 57. Uh, just a couple of Psalms earlier, Psalm 55, David provides a powerful testimony. He's so troubled, he's so burdened down, the trials are pressing in upon him that he cries out, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. How often do we feel like that in the midst of pressures and temptations and worries? If I could just get out of here, if I could just leave all of my worries behind. Well, Here's what David says out of his own experience. He proved it to be true. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. What a wonderful promise that not only is this something we're to do to cast our burdens and our cares upon the Lord, but to have this promise he won't let you down. He won't fail you. He won't fail to take those burdens and deal with them. He will sustain you. He will hold you up. He will help you to be strong. David is saying, in essence, it works. This biblical solution is the very thing that you need to provide peace to your soul. Paul in the New Testament says essentially the same thing. In his letter writing to the Philippians, he says in chapter 4, Be anxious for nothing. Bring your problems to God in prayer. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There it is again. Be anxious for nothing. Give those cares to the Lord. And he will cause his peace like a soldier to guard your heart so that you'll know and you'll experience calm because God will be faithful to deal with your concerns. So here is a true solution that never fails. It's the biblical solution to our worries and to our cares. Cast them upon the Lord. Now that brings us thirdly to the great encouragement that comes along with this exhortation. The great encouragement. Peter would urge us on in this work of casting our cares upon the Lord by this most tender, beautiful statement. Because he cares for you. Cast all of your anxieties onto the Lord because he cares for you. He reminds every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ that as a believer in Christ, as a child of God, he has a most favored standing before the Lord. 
He is a child of the King of Heaven. And that King has committed himself to the eternal care of every member of his family. If we had time to go through this letter of First Peter, we would see how the Apostle has proven this over and over again. He shows, for instance, in chapter 1, God's eternal care for us in the fact that he has saved us. He chose us back in eternity. Through the working of the Spirit of God, he's set us apart, and he has redeemed us through the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. He sent his Son into the world to be our Savior. That's how much he cares for us. And if you were to summarize God's care in the first chapter of this letter, you would say, if the whole Godhead has so exerted itself to save us from sin and hell, surely we must conclude he loves us very, very much. And he must care for us very, very much. In chapter 2, Peter goes on to show us how God has brought us to be part of his church. And in, as his church in the world, we are a very special treasure to him. He's poured out mercy upon us. He's brought us to be his people. He's given us this incredible privilege of living for his honor and glory in the world. How he delights in us. What a favored position he has given to us. Surely he must care for us very, very much. Now, this is something that we all should know. It's familiar truth. If you know the gospel, in a sense, this is the most elementary truth. God loves you. He's loved you from all eternity. He's loved you through the course of human history. And he will love you into eternity. There will never be a day when God will not love you with the entirety of his being. And so if he loves you, that means he cares for you. He's committed to you. He's going to watch over you and provide for you everything that you need. That's the most basic truth. And yet how easily do we forget it? How easily do we try to live without this truth, without our minds being filled, our souls being overwhelmed with the love of God for us? It's a great reminder of what a clever and deceitful sin worry is. Worry not only stirs up our minds and hearts so that we're troubled over various issues, Worry tries to persuade us that God doesn't care. After all, isn't that why we worry? It's unbelief trying to persuade us. God's not really interested in your problems. There are bigger things for him to pay attention to in this world. And when we are worrying, we are believing that lie. We are in essence saying, God doesn't care for me. It's noteworthy to look into the scriptures and see the number of times the disciples questioned the concern of our Savior. In Mark chapter 4, we have the story of the Lord Jesus and his disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee. And our Savior is exhausted after a long day of ministry. And so he's gone to the back of the boat and he's lying there on a bench and he's fallen fast asleep. And in the meantime, a, a terrible storm has come up on the lake. And the wind is blowing and the waves are pounding against the side of the ship and even coming over the side and the ship is beginning to fill with water. And the disciples come back and they wake up Jesus and they cry, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They didn't ask him about his ability to calm the storm. It was, do you care? Don't you care? What an accusation. 
Later in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, Jesus is in Bethany. He's in the home of those good friends, Mary and Martha. Martha is running around with uh, like a chicken with her head cut off. There's so much to be done, and she's trying to attend to it all. Finally, she's so exasperated because Mary isn't helping her, but she's chosen to sit at the feet of Jesus. And so Martha comes and breaks into the room and even interrupts the Lord Jesus in the middle of his teaching to say, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? What a statement. What an accusation. Jesus, do you care about me? in the midst of all of my troubles. We perhaps have not vocalized it like those early disciples or Martha, but surely in the midst of our worrying, that is the conclusion that we've come to, that we've got all of these trials pressing in upon us. There's these difficulties, these roadblocks in our lives, these discouragements, that have come to us these great problems and we're worrying and and our our souls are churning with anxiety and care and, and we're thinking lord do you care about me do, do you really love me in the midst of all of these difficulties i think we might almost gasp to hear the disciples and to hear martha's words don't you care because we know, of course, Jesus cares. We know intuitively that Jesus cares so deeply for his disciples. And yet when we allow worry to fill our hearts and refuse to cast our cares upon the Lord, we're saying, if not audibly, at least in our hearts, I don't believe that the Lord cares. How we need to plead with God for his grace how we need to ask him to come and help us, that as we recognize the problem that we face of worry living in our world, no matter what the circumstances are, that there is a biblical solution. It's to believe that our God is willing and able to take all of our cares, all of our anxieties, and deal with them. And he's invited us to come. He's exhorted us to come. He's told us to cast them like a blanket upon him. And he's brought us this encouragement because he cares for us, because he loves us, because he's a God of tender kindness, loving kindness, mercy, and care. And he will provide for his people every day, every hour, every moment. Is that what you believe? Is that what you are practicing in your life every day? Here in the midst of this pandemic, as you hear bad news, as your heart is concerned, either for yourself or for your loved ones, are you bringing all of these cares and are you casting them upon the Lord? How we need to plead that God would give us grace to do these very things. And how this is a reminder to us to go back again and learn the gospel all over. When, when we're struggling with these concerns and with these cares, to go to Calvary and through the pictures of the gospel, to look upon our Lord Jesus and see him there because he cares for us, because he loves for us, loves us, because he want, wanted us to escape hell and, and escape the dominion of sin and know the glorious freedom of the children of God. And that freedom includes freedom from worry and anxiety, the things that stir up our soul and rob us of our peace. We need to learn the gospel all over again. Maybe you're listening today and you don't even know God through Jesus Christ. 
and yet you know that your heart is filled with worry and concern. Uh, there are cares weighing you down. And I simply invite you with the words of the Lord Jesus, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to the Lord Jesus today. Bring him all your troubles. Bring him your sin problem. Bring him the cares of your life. And ask him to save you. Ask him to deliver you. Ask him to care for your soul. And our Lord Jesus promises that he will never turn anyone away. And so if you don't know Christ, come to him today. And know this wonderful freedom and liberty that he brings to every sinner through the gospel. Well, let's close our time together in prayer. Gracious Father, how we thank you for this exhortation of your word. This encouragement to come to you with all of our concerns. Oh, our Father, when we stop and think about our worries and the anxieties that fill our heart and we consider who you are and how you have loved us and how powerful you are and how willing you are to help your people, what are these trifling burdens that we allow to weigh us down? Please forgive us for our unbelief. Help us day after day to cast all of our anxieties upon you. Help us to believe this encouragement that you do care for us. Heavenly Father, please watch over us in these days as we remain apart. We do ask again that in your mercy you would work in our country, that you would cause this danger to subside that you would encourage our government leaders, that we might be able to uh, safely gather again to the, uh, um, in, in the church building. Oh, our Father, please bring this about in your kindness and in your goodness. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. And we look forward to that day when we'll be able to, uh, in, in some way, fulfill that other part of the benediction. Greet one another with uh, the kiss of love. We look forward to that day when we'll be able to either kiss one another or hug one another or shake one another's hands and just rejoice in the grace of God. It's been a blessing to spend this time with you today. May the Lord be with you.